So I wanted to ask this. When you think of a king, what do you think of? What do you think of when you think of a king? What? Royalty, Royalty. okay. What else do we think of when we think of a king? Jewels, Jewels and a crown, okay. What else? <laughs> what? Power. Power, yes. We have a lot of kings in the Lutheran church. Power, riches. riches. What else? Dilly dilly. Dilly dilly? <laughs> You're definitely Lutheran. God bless you. Anything else we think of? Well, do we think of a king as being humble? Do we think of a king as being someone who subjects themselves to others? Do we think of a king in servitude? Not usually. But the amazing thing about Advent and what Advent does is it helps us to focus on <clears throat> who and what a king truly is, and that's Jesus. Advent causes us to do two focus, two focuses on the king. The first is his birthday, his incarnation as King Jesus came into this world to be our Lord and Savior. And he lived a life of servitude and subjection to people. In fact, so much so that we know he gave his life for us. He died for his people. What king has ever done that? And then we think about Jesus' second coming, when he'll return as king again, once again, on that final day, when he returns as king over all the earth, this time with victory in his wings, to call us home to be with him forever, whether we're living and he calls us up, or whether we're called out of that grave, to be with him in heaven where he reigns for eternity. But he reigns with love and grace and mercy and kindness and healing, where he wipes away every tear and mends every brokenness. You see, that's the kind of king we have. And so this devotional booklet's going to help us to focus on the coming king. Tonight, our reading comes from Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Simple, very simple. And Matthew, if you know, opens up with the genealogy of Jesus, and he says this. This is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah, and his brothers. Now it's very interesting when you contrast Matthew's genealogy with Luke's genealogy because Luke's genealogy all, goes all the way back to Adam and ultimately God. But Matthew starts with Abraham. Why would Matthew start with Abraham? Because he was Jewish. And who is the father of the promise? Of the, promise the new covenant that was made. Abraham, right? And so, of course, Matthew would start his wonderful gospel telling the Jewish people, listen, I'm starting with Abraham because Abraham was promised that his descendants would be numerous as the stars in the sky and that through him the world would be blessed. In essence, he's jumping up and down and saying to the world, pay attention, Jesus is the blessing that has come from Abraham. So our devotion for tonight says Abraham was the father of Isaac. If there's one verse in the New Testament Abraham would have loved to read ahead of time, it's probably this one. God reached out to a childless man in the ancient Middle East and promised, I will make you a great nation. God kept that promise when Isaac was born 25 years later. What a long time to wait in faith. But it was worth it, as Abraham and Sarah knew when they cradled their newborn son in their arms. But the other part of the promise took even longer. You will be a blessing, God said, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. God was speaking of Jesus, Abraham's descendant, who would give himself for the life of the world. God's people would wait roughly 2,000 years for that promise to be kept. But was it worth it? As every, as every forgiven, beloved child of God knows, it was worth it. So what are you waiting for right now? Perhaps it is something where you can reasonably hope to see the outcome in the near future. Graduation from school, a wedding, a birth, the start of a new job, or retirement. Or maybe something that won't happen until Jesus returns and raises us all up from the dead like final, complete healing of our bodies, reconciliation with a loved one, or peace on earth. Whatever it is, we can wait and hope, trusting it will be worth it. 
that the Lord who makes so many great promises will keep every one of them. Sometimes we get so weary, you know. We ask God in prayer for things and it just seems like we're waiting and waiting and waiting. You know, I tell people there are three answers to prayer. There's yes, no, and wait. I hate wait. I don't like waiting. I'm the type of person that if we go to a restaurant and there's a five minute wait, I say to Stephanie, we're going elsewhere. And by the time we drove to the second restaurant, we could have already been seated and eating, you know, that kind of person, right? I don't like waiting. I just don't. I'm impatient and I admit that and I don't pray for patience and I advise you not to either. We'll talk about that some other time. But I don't like waiting. Imagine the promise that God made to Abraham and the people knew the promise. They had the, the, the law, the scriptures, the Torah they had, the writings. 2,000 years later, God finally answers the promise. But what we do know is that God's timing is always perfect. And what we do believe is that God will answer our prayers. Sometimes it's no and sometimes it's yes and sometimes it's wait. Waiting is a spiritual discipline. We call it a time of abiding. Simply just living life knowing and trusting that the Lord Jesus Christ is with you. And that he's going to answer your prayer. And that he's going to be faithful to you. And that everything is going to work out to his glory and to your benefit. But abiding and waiting is hard. We know it was hard for Abraham and Sarah. Don't we? I mean, they waited for the promise 25 years and we all know what they did. She gave Abraham another woman and said, here, make a son. We'll fulfill the promise on our own. That didn't work too well, did it? Waiting is hard work. But the hope that waiting builds, the anticipation that waiting gives, truly builds excitement in our lives. The questions for tonight says this, what are you waiting for right now? Name anything you like. And so I'll say this. There's a couple things I'm waiting for. I'm waiting for a reconciliation with my dad. I know that won't happen until we're both in heaven, but I know it will happen and it will be perfect. I'm waiting to see my children again. And I know that won't happen until the day I'm in heaven and it will be perfect. And I can't wait for that day. It's exciting. I'm waiting in the short term to be a better husband. If any of you wives out there have tips or husbands have tips on how to be a better husband, please let me know. I'm still trying to grow and be better. But that's something we all strive for, I hope. And wives too. And we wait. And we grow. Is there anything you're waiting for in your life that you'd like to share? And you don't have to. How does it feel to wait? Let me ask you that. How does it feel to wait, to abide? What's the hardest part of waiting for you and why? Doubt? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because when we're waiting, Satan does what? He likes to come in and cause us to doubt God's promise. And that's when we come back together as a family in Christ and we hear God's word and we receive the sacraments and we're reminded of God's promise and the doubt is, is dis expelled, dispelled, it's dispersed. What else? Anticipation. Anticipation. Yep, anticipation. Anticipation can be a blessing and a curse because it can cause anxiety and it can cause joy. Or both at the same time even, trust me, I've been there. What else? Anything else? Why is waiting hard? Lack of patience. Lack of patience. Bob, you have a lot of patience, so I know that doesn't apply to you. Oh, his wife laughed at that one. That's funny. Okay. What else? Anybody else? Any other idea? Why is it hard to wait? Any other ideas why? Why is it hard to wait? Because we're not in control. What was original sin? Wanting to be in control. Wanting to be like God, right? And we have to wait when we have to abide when God's waiting and doing things in our lives and we're sitting back and we're wondering what's going to happen. We think to ourselves, okay, I'm not in control. I don't have control. I don't like being out of control. Henry, do you have something to say? What? God made us. He did. You're right. And because he made us, we know that he's going to fulfill his promises to us, right? Even when we're waiting. And here's the great thing about what we call the abiding time or the waiting time. 
it's perhaps one of the best times and seasons that we can go through in our life. You know why? Because it causes us to be more dependent upon God. It forces us to be in communication with Him. And it causes our faith to grow. And that's one of the gifts that God wants to give us every day. Which of many of God's promises is the closest to your heart right now? So if out of all God's promises to you, does anybody have one that's close to your heart right now that you're thinking about? Mine is always the re resurrection or, the, or, the, or going to heaven. Mine is always going to heaven. I'm a weird person, okay? People look at me like I'm weird because I'm a kingdom thinking person. I think differently than the rest of the world. I think about the kingdom. And that sometimes gets me in trouble at this level with you guys because I'm thinking about the kingdom and, and because I'm thinking about the kingdom, it's not always what everybody else wants, right? Okay, so being part of a person who thinks about the kingdom, I look forward to death. I'm excited about it. Now, I'm not saying that I, I'm going to make it happen. But I look forward to it with great joy. Steph will tell you that every time I sing a hymn and one of the last verses talks about Jesus coming or our dying, I start blubbering like a baby because I'm excited for the day to go home to heaven to see Jesus and my children. There is anticipation, hope, and joy in that. But I know for now I must wait. But the promise of heaven is probably the nearest and dearest to me. What about you guys? Any promises from God that are near and dear to you right now? Maybe this time of season? Yes, Tom. Uh, the other day I, I was kind of working in the kitchen and I found this dish bar, right? And uh, it is from the church uh, in Scotland. And they were celebrating anniversary. And it said over 700 years Wow. And then I thought about church. I can do that for us today. Because we're going to have 700 years. Yeah, 700 years in one place worshiping. That's great. That's awesome. And that, that is a promise God does make. Right? When his church is faithful, he is faithful too. Very true. And even when his church isn't faithful, he is faithful. That's the good thing. Easy. No, I'm sure not to. That's right. Anybody else promise near and dear to you this time of year? Yes, ma'am. That's right. That's what his incarnation means, doesn't it? When John says the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us, what he meant is that he made his tabernacle among us, his dwelling place, his holy living place. And he lives in each and every one of us. And he, he's never far off. He is with us each and every day of our lives. Even when we turn to walk away in sin, Jesus is still with us with his arms wrapped around us, loving us and gently nudging us back towards him. And that's what the Christmas promise is all about. And that's the kind of king we need, the leader we need. One who in his great compassion is always there to protect us, to hold us, to love us, and to forgive us. In Jesus' name, amen.